subject that is you know, basic and at the same time very important, very heavy. Often, or how often, have you made a promise with little or no intention of keeping it? Perhaps you promised not to tell something or someone that someone had told you, or maybe you promised to help a friend and then you failed to perform. Nowhere in the Bible do we find a religious duty to make promises. Our promises are actually made quite voluntarily. However, if we make a promise, Scripture requires that we keep and fulfill our obligation. And that's what we're going to spend our time talking about this morning. We're going to spend time talking about promises. We're going to begin with that scripture reading that Mark just read to us out of Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 21 through 23. I'm not going to read it again, but let's just understand what it was that it was said. You see, seer, or excuse me, vows are taken seriously. There isn't a vow or a promise that the Lord does not consider to be valid. A vow not kept he points out in Deuteronomy, is sin. Refusing to make a promise, he says, is not sin. In fact, one of the best ways to prevent yourself from not fulfilling a promise is by not ever making one. And the Lord tells us very plainly, all the way back in Deuteronomy, the same precept, and we see the same concepts that are actually repeated in the New Testament concerning promises. Because promises actually are made voluntarily, they must be performed. They must be kept. We are not at liberty to decide if our word is worth keeping. If we make a promise, we have to keep our promise. In fact, let's continue on with the Old Testament and go into Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> and here in chapter, seven, or chapter 5, verses 4 through 6, we find out that fools are the ones who break their promises. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, starting at verse 4. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. For he, being God, has no pleasure in fools. Now he's equating those who don't keep their promises to being fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Same concept we just talked about out of Deuteronomy. It's better not to make a promise at all than to make a promise and then not keep it. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. Here the verse is telling us to make a promise and not keep it is a sin. Nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. In other words, don't make an excuse for your promises not kept. You made the promise. Yes, you, perhaps you found out that you can't or won't do it anymore. But don't make an excuse for it. It's still sin. Why should God be angry? at your excuse, and destroy the works of your hands. So in other words, why would you give God yet another reason to be upset with you? Why would you give God yet another reason to be angry with you? Not only did you not keep your vow, but now you're making excuses as to why you can't keep a vow, and the implication is, is that's just as wrong. We find out in this short reading already, just two passages. <coughs> Vows are serious. We have to keep our vows. We have to keep our promises. You see, in Ecclesiastes 5, he's telling us, keep your promises and, and make them quick. Don't allow them to, to linger on. In fact, he, again, he makes the same idea. It's better not to make a promise, not to make a promise, than to make one and not keep it. And again, don't make excuses for your vows. Not kept. You see, there are some examples of promises kept if you do want to see. And people have made promises and have made vows, and indeed, <coughs> they have been honored for keeping their promises. We're going to start with Hannah in First Samuel, First Samuel chapter one, and we're going to read verses one through eleven. I'm going to apologize up front because it has a bunch of names in here that <clears throat> I do not know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. But we'll do our best. Now, there was a certain man of Ramathungan, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroboam, Jer son of Elihim, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, uh, an Ephraim. 
He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the other, and the name of the other, Benina. Benina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. <clears throat> also the two sons of Eli, Hopni, Hopni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came that Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Beniah, his wife, and all his sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely and made her miserable, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why does your heart grieve? Am I not better than you, than, better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat of the doorpost on the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow, a promise, and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant, remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Now let's hop over to verse 20 to see the fulfillment of it. So it came to pass, in the process of time, that Hannah conceived and bore a son, and called his name Samuel saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. Hannah did exactly as she promised. She made a promise to God and asked God if she would open her womb, allow her to have a child. In fact, she specified a male child, and if he would do so, that he would give that child back to the Lord in his service of his life. And that's exactly what he did. she did. His name was Samuel, and he became a, quite a leader. As we know, in fact, the book of 1 and 2 Samuel are named after him. The individual, Samuel himself, was a byproduct, if you will, of a vow or a promise kept. So we're not saying vows are wrong. We're not saying it's wrong to make a promise. It's just that if you make a promise, you better intend upon keeping it. And it was barren, greatly bothered by. She promised to give this child to the Lord, and she did just as she promised. Let's go to verse 26 through 28 of the same chapter. And she said, O oh my Lord, as my soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I pray, prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked for of him. Therefore I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he will be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. And again, the idea is a promise kept. Another example of a promise kept is a, one that troubles a lot of people. And it's out of the book of Judges. And his name is Jephthah. Judges chapter 11, verses 30 through 35. <coughs> or 36. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of the house to me, then I will return, when I return, in peace from the people of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah advanced towards the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he defeated them from Aora, as far as Mineth, Twenty cities, and to Abel Karim, for a very great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. <clears throat> then, when Jephthah came to his house in Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass, when he saw her, that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, 
and I cannot go back on it. So she said to him, My father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. Now this is really a difficult promise that Jephthah had to keep. It was a rash promise, a promise that probably wasn't well thought out. In fact, we know it was. He makes a promise that he says that anything that comes out of that door of his house, upon his return, he would sacrifice in a burnt offering. And he specifies the burnt offering. He says that he will give that animal, and I guess this is what he was expecting, to come out of his house, because back in those days, animals lived in the house just probably as much as people did. The doors weren't necessarily uh, shut all the time. Animals came and went, and he basically said, the first thing out that door, I'm going to sacrifice. If the Lord would provide him a victory with the Ammonites. Now understand, Jephthah didn't have to make that vow. In fact, let me reiterate, no one has to make a vow. No one has to make a promise. No one ever has to make a deal. Contract or otherwise. When we think about this, this subject, the Lord is saying he wants you to keep your word. And whatever you say, you need to keep. That's according to the passages that we have already rehearsed. He promised to sacrifice the first thing that came out of that door. And it just happened to be his only daughter. In fact, he neither had son nor daughter other than her, her his only child. She came out of the door upon his return. And did Jephthah make excuses? Remember what we just talked about? Does the Lord like excuses? Does the Lord appreciate the excuses? Not at all. The Lord says he gets angry at those who make excuses. And we find Jephthah not trying to even make an excuse, which is very honorable as well. We find out also that Jephthah kept his promise. In verse 39 through 40 of chapter 11, And it was so at the end of two months that she returned to her father, and he carried out his vow which he with, with her, which he had vowed. She knew no man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gideon. <clears throat> Jephthah kept his word. Now, I have an article on this particular situation and this particular promise kept in the uh, bulletin today, if you want to read that as well, for further information about the ins and outs of that particular situation. But nonetheless, what we find out is Jephthah, the man of honor, made a promise. It was a rash promise. And he didn't make an excuse. He didn't want to anger the Lord more by trying to, oh, I didn't really mean it, which is what a lot of us do. Right? We say something that we don't really mean, or we make a rash promise right off the bat, and then we turn around and we realize, oh, right, you mean you actually want me to do what I said I was going to do? Oh, I didn't really mean it. That's not satisfactory to the Lord. Doing so is just as sinful as not keeping and the Lord will hold us accountable for promises not yet. So you might be thinking, well then, how strict are we to honor our promises? How strict should we be? Does that mean everything that comes out of my lips, I have got to keep? Every promise that I make, I've got to keep? And that's really what we're trying to impress upon everyone, is yes, the Lord expects us to keep our word. Let's start over here at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, let's read verses 33 through 37. <clears throat> Again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Now understand what the Lord is saying. He is saying, in essence, let your word be your mind. Your yeses are yes, and your noes are no. Whatever it is that you promise is what has to be kept. If we don't keep our promise... He says that we are just servants of Satan. Think about that. 
a baptized Christian, a believer in Christ, who doesn't keep his word is a servant of Satan if he doesn't keep his promises. Mean what you say and say what you mean. Don't make promises you won't keep. In fact, again, the Lord says don't make a promise because it's better for you not to make a promise. sons also tells us or teaches us to appreciate our words. Matthew chapter 21. Let's read verse 28. Matthew 21 starting at 28. But what do you think, old man who had two sons, a man who had two sons, he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, but he did not go. Then the Lord asked in verse 31, Which of the two did the will of his father? Which of the two do you think did as the father requested? You see, the parable of two sons really teaches us to keep our word. How often do we make promises to help, but then we fail to perform? We say we're going to do something, and then we don't do it. Maybe we feel obligated to be the, the guy who steps up, but no real intention of actually stepping up. If we can help. The Lord says don't do that. Don't be the individual who doesn't keep his word. Paul said an untrustworthy person is deserving of death. Do you know that? Actually, it's recorded for us in Romans chapter 1. That long list of very wicked things that Paul goes through, uh, mostly talking about the debauchery of the human race at the time. But nonetheless, he goes through a long list of things that people, evil people do. But one of those evil, evil things he mentions in verse 31 to Romans chapter 1 is untrustworthy. He says these are untrustworthy people. And then he says in verse 32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Who's deserving of death? Well, as applicable to our lesson, it's the individual who's untrustworthy. An untrustworthy person is worthy and deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. As like any other sin in this world, Wicked people like it when you imitate their wickedness. When you are just like them, you're doing what it is that they do. And one of those things that wicked people do is they don't keep their word. In other words, they lie. They make promises without the intent of keeping them. And even whether you had the intent or not, as we've already pointed out, if you make a promise, make sure that you keep it. That's one of the reasons why when I'm talking to parents, Tell them very clearly. Don't tell your kids you're going to do something and not do it. Don't tell your kids you're going to take them to Disneyland if they're doing this or that. Because if you don't do it, you just lie to them. And God will hold you accountable for lies or, i.e., promises not yet. In fact, Solomon tells us a fool has more hope than a person who doesn't keep his promise. That's just kind of putting it in perspective so that we understand that promises mean something to God. Our word is our bond. Proverbs chapter 29, verse, 30, verse 20. Do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. There is more hope for a fool, an individual who doesn't care about God, a person who doesn't regard God's word. A fool, somebody who doesn't live his life according to God's will, has more hope of salvation than a man who is hasty in his words, than a man who won't keep his promises. You think, how's that possible? Because a man hasty in his words isn't likely to repent of those things. But a fool at least has a chance of making his life right with the Lord. Think about how important it is for us to keep our word. Now, I just want to make this one other application. If we promise to love our spouse until
until death do we part. Does God expect us to keep that promise? Now, we made that vow. In fact, most of the time we make that vow, and I try to tell people that are getting married, you don't have to say this. You don't have to say until death do you part. Now, that's how the Lord prescribes it anyway, and the Lord expects it. But nonetheless, you don't have to make the vow. Again, all promises, all, all vows are voluntary. We don't have to make any of them. What we say at the altar of marriage can be something different. Just because the tradition says we have to say this, doesn't mean we have to say this. Now, that doesn't mean that you're any less in trouble, trouble with the Lord for breaking your marriage. But nonetheless, that vow didn't have to be made, is my point. Malachi chapter 2 verse 14. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. And a little later, verse 16, that he being God hates divorce. Now understand, we make promises. Was our marriage vow hastier than Jephthah's vow? You see, Jephthah, I think, made a pretty rash vow. I don't think he thought it out. He didn't think of the possible consequences. He didn't think it through. He said the first thing through his doors he would sacrifice, thinking, I'm sure, in his mind, it would be some form of an animal, because he had animals first. But when we get married, know that we're making a lifelong commitment to somebody. And we know that we're making a promise to that other person. And that, that covenant, which is a promise, is before God. So I suppose whether you said it or not, it's immaterial, isn't it? My point being is, is, is the Lord going to hold us accountable for a promise like that? When we break our marriage vows? If we don't ask God to forgive us? If we don't repent of what we have rather sacrifice a daughter than break a vow to God. Lord God. Makes it a heavy lesson, doesn't it? Now, if God were as faithful in keeping his promises as we are in keeping our promises, would he reach heaven? Think about that. If God was as faithful in keeping his promises as we are in keeping our promises, That's recorded for us out of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. And it goes on, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord made a promise way back when. And he said he's not slack concerning his promise. He's going to keep his promise. He's just going to allow more time. Suffer. Believe us. Believe me. Believe with God's word. God will keep his promises and does keep his promises. In fact, God said that he would forgive our sins if we would just confess them. Again, a promise that he makes. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1, last passage. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he being God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we would just confess our sins, implied in that is repenting. But if we would just do that, the Lord says he would forgive us our sins. And God keeps his promises as we've already noted. He does not lie. Folks, when we promise to serve God, God expects us to keep our word. So I'm really asking this morning, have you failed in your promise to remain faithful to God? Have you failed to keep your promises? Understand promises, vows, your word are very, very important to the Lord. And they're just yet another thing that will and could come up to bite us in the judgment. We need to be people who watch.
watch our words and be very careful of what we say and certainly what we promise. And if we want to go to heaven, then we're going to have to keep our words. We're going to have to be people who say what we mean, mean what we say. There can be no other way. If by chance you need our prayers, we'd be glad to pray along with you. Please come as we stand and sing the invitations.